What's up, everybody? Dr. Shadi Rafich here, Boris Fight Surgeon. We're here to talk about enucleations, removal of the eye. Um, it's a, it is a sad procedure, you know, for the most part, because nobody wants their, their four-legged companion to, to uh, lose an eye. Of course, we are usually doing it as, as a last resort because there are no other medical options to salvage that eye. And that typically means that the disease is pretty significant. You either have really severe end-stage glaucoma or uveitis. You have a severe proptosis of the eye. Um, there is cancer or severe infection infiltrating the eye. And so typically if you're removing the eye, you're doing it for a good reason. So um, as sad as it is, uh, just like amputation, nobody wants to remove any organ or appendage. Um, it's sad, but it needs to be done. And so I wanna talk about enucleation. The reason why this is a uh, popular topic amongst veterinarians and amongst pet owners is because it can be a tricky surgery to perform, especially if you have not performed many of them. And the ones that are either in really small patients, patients with abnormal anatomy or extensive disease, it can be quite challenging to perform such a procedure. So it's one that I've had requests for and we'll go over in this video as well. It's important for pet owners to know because it is, it is a common trauma or illness to, um, to see in the eye. For pet owners and uh, many pet owners try diligently to follow the ophthalmologist or the veterinarian's instructions to try and salvage the eye sometimes it's just not possible there's too extensive disease or the the uh, level of disease has not been addressed early enough and so now the changes are reversible so let's talk about it um, i am going to focus mostly on medical terminology here i'll try to elaborate when i can for those for those uh subscribers who are pet owners and not savvy with the medical stuff but that's okay We'll get through it. So if you look at the literature, there is some level of overlap with how you define these, or these ocular procedures. Uh, so there's three basic types of, of eye surgeries you can perform that ends up, ends up with the result of removing the eye. The first one is evisceration. So evisceration is one that I've never performed before. It's probably more an ophthalmology a specialist procedure, but evisceration, the idea behind that is you want to maintain the globe. You still want the cornea and the sclera to be maintained. So so you have disease that's really isolated to the inner portions of the eye, the, the, uh, the intraorbital contents of the eye. And then you're filling up that space once you remove the intraorbital contents with a prosthetic, an intrascleral prosthetic. So the idea here is to maintain cosmetics of the eye. You'll still have a globe, you'll still have functional eyelids, there'll still be eye movement. And so it's, it's very, very specific to those patients that have really just disease that are, that's confined to the intraocular space. Um, the, I won't speak too much about this procedure because it is out of my expertise. I've never performed one before, but that's the idea with the evisceration is, is replacing the intraorbital contents, um, the intraocular contents rather with a prosthetic. It's one that you don't want to recommend for those pets that don't have good eye movement. They have weak muscles surrounding the eye because it defeats the whole purpose of the procedure and, um, and is um, probably likely to have complications, especially if they can't blink. So that brings us to two complications of, of evisceration, which is corneal ulcerations because the cornea is still present, um, as well as uh, uh, KCS, dry eye, um, carado conjunctivitis sica. And so those are, those are also those are conditions that are well-known complications of evisceration, but that's a very specific category of surgery that is probably limited to ophthalmologists, and that's what we'll say about evisceration. Then when you look at the two surgeries that involve removal of the eye, there is significant overlap between these two procedures. So you can have enucleation, which is what we tend to call removal of the eye, and then there's exenturation, they both involve removal of the eye, but there's different components to what you're removing. So we'll start with the nucleation first. And, and, and by the way, if you hear your veterinarian or anybody talking about nucleation, they're probably referring to either nucleation or exenturation. We sort of use nucleation as the umbrella term to, to, to mean removal of the eye. So, but the specifics are based on the uh, surgical technique, the surgeon, and what disease you're trying to, trying to manage. So with a nucleation, the goal here is to remove the globe, the entire globe, and the third eyelid. You're trying to leave the orbital contents behind. And the idea behind this is to have improved cosmetics. 
So you, you'll still have a, a relatively speaking full looking eye. There are two approaches to this. You can have a subconjunctival approach and you can have a transpalpebral approach. So the subconjunctival approach is where you go through the conjunctiva of the eye to access the globe and the third eyelid and remove. And you can add to that removal of the eyelid margins as well to try and eliminate sort of weird looking eyelid movements in the eyeball that's no longer there. You then, once you remove the eye, you can reconstruct the conjunctiva and, um, and the, uh, the eyelids and you have an, an, a globe that's now absent, but still has a relatively full, full appearance to it. And that's the subconjunctival approach. The transpalpebral approach is my preference where the incision actually incorporates removal of the eyelid margins and that's followed by blunt and sharp dissection of the entire conjunctiva around the globe to remove the globe. The end result is probably the same, cosmetically speaking. It's just a matter of what kind of incision you want to perform. You either can go through the conjunctiva with a subconjunctival approach and then trim the eyelid margins if you want to with a nucleation like that or the transpalpebral approach where you're removing the eyelid margins plus the globe at the same time. And that's the one that I prefer is the transpalpebral. So that's a nucleation. We have some subconjunctival approach as well as transpalpebral. And the third category and final category is exenturation. Exenturation involves removing the globe and the third eyelid, just like you do with the nucleation, but now you're also going to remove the orbital contents and the eyelid margins. You're removing everything. And exenturation is, is a procedure that's reserved for those pets that either have really extensive trauma to the, to the globe, really extensive infection, or cancer that goes beyond the inner, the inner portions of the globe, and it's affecting the tissues around it. Um, I actually really like this procedure for the majority of my, of my eye removals. Even if a patient probably can get away with the nucleation, I actually prefer exenturation. You remove the globe, the third eyelid, the orbital contents, the eyelid margins, you remove everything. And the reason why I like that is because I've seen, I've seen a handful of cases performed by other surgeons where the secretory tissue that's in the conjunctiva that surrounds the, the orbit still produces um, fluid and you'll end up having eyes that will build, build up with fluid. And then that can translate to not only a leakage of the incision and the dehiscence of the incision, but also can have a secondary infection from that. Um, I, I find that most clients really don't care about the cosmetics of the eye um, because the problem with exenturation is that you end up having kind of more of a sunken in eye, eye appearance. It looks like an, like an empty eye socket, basically. In the beginning, it'll look full because of inflammation and swelling and fluid. But then after the healing proceeds, you're gonna end up having a, a kind of a, a sunken in socket. And cosmetically, it looks a little bit ghostly, but I'll be honest with you, the pet doesn't care. And I have yet to have a client who, who uh, regrets performing that procedure. Um, the cosmetics really is, is not the point. If, if the eye disease is that badly, advanced and your pet is suffering from the ocular disease that it's that it has then exenturation is really my preference anyway for the majority so i really don't perform pure nucleations anymore although we'll call it a nucleations it's really exenturation so we have evisceration with the prosthetic you have a nucleation with two different approaches to it where you're still leaving the orbital contents and then you have exenturation where you're removing everything including the eyelid margins orbital contents the globe the third eyelid and you end up with that kind of sunken in look to it the, the, the one portion of all these of the, of the nucleation and exenturation procedures that everyone's afraid of is the optic nerve. And the reason why the optic nerve is of a concern is because if you pull too hard, if there's too much traction on the optic nerve, you can actually cause trauma to not only the optic chiasm, which is where the optic nerves merge uh, uh, to the brain, but you can also affect the contralateral optic nerve and create either temporary or permanent blindness in the other eye. So that's a problem. Uh, that's a very big problem. And so you wanna make sure that while you're maintaining traction of the eye, rotating it as you're doing your blunt and sharp dissections, you wanna make sure you don't, you don't uh, place too much traction on the optic nerve. Because causing a contralateral blindness is gonna be devastating on many levels. So you have to balance trying to manipulate the eyeball that you're removing, but also not, not putting too much traction towards you while you're trying to remove it. And so that brings us to the, uh, the final point that I wanna bring up, which is what do you do with the optic nerve? 
So the optic nerve by itself tends not to be that vascular, although I have had cases where it's been quite vascular. There's a, there, there can be vessels that run along with the nerve. And you don't want to place traction to, to uh, cause trauma to the other eye. At the same time, you want traction so you would be able to visualize what's going on behind the eye. So what I typically will do is I've done a few modifications of this technique. Um, I'll take a curved hemostat and try to wedge it behind the, the eyeball up against the bone of the orbit. I can feel it. It's mostly blind when you're doing this. And then clamp down, sever the, uh, the optic nerve, remove the eyeball, and then try and cauterize whatever I need to or place an absorbable suture around that, around that nerve. I tend to not like to place prosthetics like suture or hemoclips there because it is still a nerve and we don't want to have any residual kind of phantom pain or anything like that from, from the uh, prosthetic. So if you're going to put a prosthetic in there to ligate the optic nerve in the vessel, then I prefer a absorbable suture or if you can, monopolar um, cautery will also, will also do the job. I have modified it where I've used ligature for this and I'm a huge fan of ligature. So if you can get a nice small ligature with a curved tip and get behind the, the eyeball, you can pretty much coagulate and transect simultaneously and it gives you a, a, a very nice end result where you're not worried about hemorrhage. I've done that with, with a fair number of success in my most recent cases and it's worked really well. I don't see a lot of collateral thermal damage to the optic chiasm and certainly not to the contralateral nerve, so uh, optic nerve, so that, that seems to work really well. And then the closure is fairly routine. If you're doing the enucleation with the subconjunctival sub approach, the transpalpebral approach, you're going to suture the conjunctiva together and then the eyelids. If you are doing the exenteration, you're basically just closing whatever tissue you have there, which pretty much is going to be the eyelid margins. Um, it'll fill up in the beginning. The owner can cold compress the area, use non steroidal anti inflammatories if they're allowed to have that, opioids, gabapentin, cold compress it, let the swelling come down. I always place skin sutures because it's very hard to control all the movement um, despite removing the eyelids and the globe. And a lot of times you're dealing with cancer or infection, there's extensive trauma there. So you, so I like the uh, skin, the skin sutures as added protection. Always have a, an e-collar on the patient as well. And like I said, antibiotics, anti-inflammatories, whatever analgesics you want to use, cold compresses. Always submit the eye for biopsy to make sure that you're not dealing with uh, some kind of manifestation of cancer. And of course, if it's not cancer, then you're hoping that it's going to be a curative uh, procedure. There are some cancers of the eye that can also be curative as well. It's not all bad news, but um, that's the nucleation. So I hope this video has helped you guys out. Any questions, let me know. Um, please place any comments or, uh, below and feel free to subscribe, hit like, share this with everybody. And I hope this video was useful. I'll see you in the next one. This is Dr. Shadia Rafidge. See you in the next one.